Are you tired of seeing more and more color models for 3D printing on internet while your boring single color printer can't print them? Then why not to make it multicolor using spare parts from old printers? Hi everyone! In the past few years since the release of the Bamboo Lab AMS, it seems like everyone has gone crazy about multicolor printing. Even back then, this wasn't something new for the community. For years, there have been various ways to print in multicolor, from technically complex tool changers to simple two-in-one adapters. But it wasn't really popular until release of the user-friendly and easy-to-setup AMS, when process became so simple anyone could try multicolor printing at home. And at first glance, not much changed. Filament swaps still took a lot of time, and the same amount of filament was wasted. But now everything happened automatically and, most importantly, reliably. A few years later, what do we see? The market is now full of similar AMS-like systems from uh, different manufacturers. At the same time, the DIY community moving forward and in some ways even stepped ahead of big companies. Some ideas are truly brilliant. Free from the constraints of marketing, people sometimes come up with incredibly interesting solutions. In our hobby, the way from idea to realization is extremely short and, in most importantly, it's fun and exciting. So that's why I decided to build my own AMS with blackjack and hookers. Let's clarify. My AMS isn't the fastest, the most compact or the smartest. In fact, if you are planning to build an AMS based on any existed project, I don't recommend using mine at this stage. There are plenty of finished projects out there with the large communities behind them. But that's not what this video is about. The purpose of this video is to show you that sometimes to bring an idea to life, you only need to look at the spare parts you've got laying around and figure out how to use them. The rest is just persistence and creativity. In my opinion, multicolor printing through a single nozzle at this stage of evolution is a waste of money. It always takes a lot of extra filament and time. Multimaterial printing, like for dissolvables or removable supports, makes much more sense. But even for that, single nozzle setups can be inconvenient due to material mixing during swaps. But sometimes you just want to print something that looks nice. So, after converting two Ender 3s into one Corex Y printer, there were a few extra stepper motors left and I also found a couple of old feeders. I started with the simplest options, using two motors and two-in-one adapter I found online. Unlike well-known Bowden setups, I kept the big UH2 on the print head. The additional motors synchronize with the main extruder when needed. The main printer board didn't have any extra ports for motors, but I had a spare big 3 E3 board laying around. So I connected it to the printer's host and configured it in Clipper as an additional MCU. You can also use the original 8-bit Ender 3 board for this task, or almost any 3D printer board as long as its microcontroller is supported by Clipper firmware. Of course, a better board will work faster and offer more features. By the way, I don't understand why this option isn't used more often. It's so simple, you immediately gain access to all the additional board ports, motors, heaters, sensors and stops, everything. These boards can even be used for other DIY projects. A few years ago, I built a camera slider using an original Ender 3 board. But that's a story for another time. The entire system is powered by the same power supply as the printer itself. It's a 350 watt unit from the very first version of Ender 3. So far, I haven't noticed any power issues. Worst case, the AMS can be powered separately. Next, I decided to expand the system to support four extruders, because that's exactly how many motors I had left from the two Ender 3s. After a couple of evenings of modeling and testing, I ended up with this device. At this stage, I used different feeder gears on the old feeders, just whatever I had on hand. In the end, I ordered several identical feeder gears, the same ones that came with the original Ender 3 feeders. For the idler rollers, I used bearings from open build wheels. High precision and perfect grip aren't critical here. 
The feeding just needed to be stable enough for the main extruder to get a consistent filament supply. For the 4-in-1 adapter I modeled something like a fork. The feeders arranged right behind the adapter. Overall the system worked, but not for long and not very reliably. The problem was that during filament change the filament was simply retracted out of the hotend. While I hoped to create a filament swap macro that would ensure consistent retraction, the reality was different. Without lowering the temperature for each swap, filament behaves unpredictably. In a Bowden setup this isn't a big deal. You can reload unevenly retracted filament into the hotend without issues. But in a direct extruder the filament tips could get tangled in the feeder gears, eventually clogging the feeding mechanism. So, like it or not, to ensure a reliable filament removal I need a blade to cut it cleanly. Traditionally I grabbed a blade from a regular hobby knife, a couple of pen springs and modeled a small cutting mechanism. I mounted it above the extruder input. On the right side of the printer frame I added a small ledge. When the blade presses against it, it cuts the filament. In the firmware I created a cutting macro that increases the motor current to prevent skipped steps. The downside of this setup was that the cut happened far from the nozzle. This meant purging all leftover filament in the extruder. Ideally the blade should be placed as close to the nozzle as possible. So I decided it was time to completely redesign the extruder. For it I used the motor and gears from my H2 extruder. Next I added a dedicated block for the blade, which could be removed if necessary. After the blade there should be hot end. Since the H2 extruder casing works in the heat sink, I couldn't use it in this configuration. So I decided to try installing a hot end from the Bamboo Lab P1P printer onto my extruder. At first glance this might not seem like a most budget friendly option. But it so happened that I received an original Bamboo Lab hotend as a gift from my friend Jonathan from the Next Layer channel. Along with it he also gave me a Chinese clone of this hotend with the changeable nozzles, which I find very convenient. The only important moment is that the Bamboo Lab hotend fan runs on 5 volts, so you either need to use a voltage step down converter or buy a 24 volt 2510 fan. The Bamboo Lab Hotend features a ceramic heater and delivers impressive flow performance. It uses ATC Semitec thermistor, which works in Clipper without problems. I was pleasantly surprised at how consistently this Hotend maintains its temperature. And now for the final and most important modification I made to my AMS, making it a bit smarter. To achieve this I needed to add sensors and set up checks for the sensors at the right moments. As a filament sensors I used end stops that were left over from the two ender trees, one sensor per filament, placed before they merged into a single channel. Adjusting the sensors to ensure the triggers consistently can be a bit tricky. For more reliable activation it's possible to slightly bend the metal lever upwards. And now the most interesting part, how does it all work? Let me say up front, I am not a programmer. Sure, I have understanding of firmware configuration, but writing new programs, especially a proper programming language like Python for example, it's too much for me. However, many tasks in Clipper can be solved using macros. Essentially macros are like a primitive programming language, mainly relying on G-code commands to control the printer. But Clipper macros offers many additional features that are perfectly suited for this kind of task. Despite spending many hours creating these macros, the algorithms are far from perfect, they definitely still have inconsistencies and bugs. In this video I won't go into the detailed algorithms behind each macro. First it would take too long, turning this video into a few hours explanation. Second, I am planning to add another sensor near the extruder, which will require updating all the checks and significantly changing the current macros. But here is an overview of the main functions in this version. All four motors are configured in the firmware as the extruder steppers C0, C1, C2 and C3. They act as additional motors for the main extruder and can synchronize with it when commanded. For each tool T1, 
T0, T1 and so on. I activate the synchronization for the necessary motor and deactivate it for all others. It's a bit bulky, but it prevents unnecessary motor movements. The end stops are configured at the filament runout sensors. I did my best trying to use a modular system for the macros. The core is the set of basic macros like purge, clean, cut, load and remove. There are also targeted macros for different situations, which call the basic macros in the required sequence. When the printer turns on, the AMS checks all sensors. If it detects already loaded filament, it assigns that extruder as active. If no filament is loaded, the printer switches to a mode without AMS. When manually loading filament, the insert macro is triggered. It uses interesting trick with the delayed G-code. I can explain exactly how it works in a separate video about macro algorithms, if you want. But in short, when the sensor is triggered, it starts the loop, where the motor retracts the filament by 0.2 mm and the loop restarts. If the sensor remains triggered, it moves again. If the sensor is released, the loop stops and the stool is set as active extruder. This way I achieved automatic filament alignment during loading stopping just before the sensor. The downside is that to manually load filament all the way to the extruder you need to disable the sensor in the web interface. The next function, which I am most proud of, not because it's most complex, but because it's incredibly convenient. The AMS automatically checks which filament is loaded and swaps it for the one required for the print. If another filament is loaded, it will be cut, removed and the correct one loaded. If no filament is loaded, the correct one will be loaded. And if the correct filament is already in place, the print will start right away. To implement this functionality beside the macros, I had to modify the slicer start G-code. And during print, when the filament change is needed, the slicer triggers the filament change G-code. The print remove macro, as the name suggests, handles unloading filament during a print. It cuts the filament and then calls the remove macro. This macro is essentially the same as the one that loads filament during the insert macro, but includes a movement cycle limit. This is the first important check during printing. If there are problems cutting the filament or if the filament somehow gets stuck during unloading, the printer will attempt to retract it for a while and if the sensor remains triggered, the printer will pause. If the filament is successfully unloaded, it stops just behind the sensor. The tool switches to the next one and the load macro is triggered, which also includes a check. Before loading filament, all sensors are checked. If any sensor is triggered, it means that paths are blocked and loading isn't possible. In such a case, the printer will also pause. The second check in this macro occurs just before the filament enters the main extruder. At this point, it checks if the loaded filament sensor has been triggered. Unfortunately, this check will only work correctly once I add another sensor near the print head. Now, if the filament gets stuck after the sensor, but before the extruder, the sensor will already be triggered and the print will continue. Then, on the next filament swap, the filament will be unloaded too far past the feeder. During the next load, the printer will pause, but it will be already too late to recover the print, so the check will save the filament, but won't save the current printing model. These are the main macros currently in use. There were many nuances related to distances, coordinates, speeds and so on. For some of these parameters, I've already created variables to make them easier to adjust, but not for all of them yet. And finally, some information about the efficiency of this system. A complete filament change takes about one minute. This is comparable to the Bumble Up A1 Mini with AMS Lite, which, by the way, is considered quite fast because it has a 4-in-1 adapter located right above the extruder. The amount of filament purged during a full change is similar to the Bumble Up P1P or X1, since I use the same hot end and the cutter knife positioned nearly in the same place. Most of the purged material is extruded on the side, downward, or into the purged bucket, while the purged tower is only used for final preparations before printing. In total, around 95 mm of filament is extruded per change. 
In the near future, I plan to figure out how to add an extra sensor to the main extruder. This will enable enough checks so that in most cases, if the problem occurs during color changes, it can be manually solved, allowing the print to continue. Apart from this, there are a major issue preventing the system from becoming stable enough to leave unattended. Filament tangling on the spool or spool holder. I need to create something like a filament buffer. I have a couple of ideas for solving this, which I'll try to implement in the next video about this device. Ok, let's summarize. The DIY multicolor printing system built from old printer parts works. I'm sure there are still many hidden problems that could appear after some time, but it's quite possible to bring this device to a stable state. If you're still watching this video, first of all, thank you. And secondly, it seems you're interested in what I'm doing. I've made a Patreon with a minimal symbolic subscription for those who can and want to support my channel. This will help bring other interesting ideas and projects to life. What about sharing this project and the Doender project? As I have already said, initially I made this project for myself and didn't think that I would have to show them to people. Therefore, before sharing, I need to put everything in order and bring it to a more or less stable version. Then I will be able to upload it somewhere. Besides project, I plan to create educational videos, tutorials for setting up new equipment, reviews and other topics. I hope you found this video interesting and, most importantly, at least a little useful. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe. And that's all for today. See you next time.